ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, and it is just afternoon on November 30th. I hope everybody had a really good Thanksgiving. Just one quick question. Who that's in the room now showed up last week? <laughs> I wonder. I, we got some feedback of a few folks. And I'm sorry, we tried to get the word out that Thanksgiving week was a, was a, a day that we weren't going to meet. I hope that it wasn't too bad a visit. Maybe you grab some lunch, whatever. But we're back. And we're back with a vengeance today. We have an absolutely wonderful speaker. As a matter of fact, we'll get to an introduction in just a second. But I don't want you to leave without marking down in your devices or on a piece of paper Saturday, 1 p.m. here, December 5th. If you've got the energy, you've got the time, we're putting door hangers on doors around here. We've done a few. We've had some positive responses. I had a lot of fun. Frankly, it was freezing fun, but fun on Saturday night at the tree lighting ceremony outside, outside of Bales Thriftway handing out some material to people that passed by. We shared a table with the Aloha Business Association. They were handing these cute little rings out that would light up. So we had a lot of young children, but the occasional adult as well. And they were saying things like, you're kidding, there's a public affairs forum? I didn't know that. So maybe getting the word out might help a little bit. You can never tell how many new folks are gonna come in. Saturday, 1 p.m., your help would be appreciated. Friends, family, you're Anybody who can be here Saturday at 1 o'clock, thank you. Folks, today we're going to take a look at Native American issues, which I believe is very important, and I'm looking forward to it. But we have a wonderful presenter who has spent a great deal of her dedication, passion, and commitment, which is enviable, as I've gotten to know Congresswoman First just a little bit over the last year or so. I'm incredibly impressed. When you look at the history, God forbid you look up Wikipedia, but if you look anywhere on the net, you're going to see a woman who is dedicated, passionate about many things, but her record with Native American issues is enviable. Without saying any more, for now, you can put up with me a little later. Ladies and gentlemen, Congresswoman first. Well, I'm probably the only person you know who carries the United States Constitution with her at all times. I've been in debates where people have quoted the Constitution, and I've said, oh, it's not in mine. Anyway, you may wonder why we're here talking about treaties and treaty issues. Well, Washington County wouldn't be Washington County if there hadn't been a treaty in 1855 where tribes uh, turned over land, uh, actually turned over title to land, and then the United States allowed states to come, and so the state turned over the land. Early, early on, when, when the countries in this world were beginning to do the great discovery and moving around, there was a convocation in Rome about the great question which was, well, what if you arrive at a country and there are people there well, are they people? That was the first issue. Are aboriginals humans? They debated that, and they decided, in their infinite wisdom, that yes, aboriginals were humans. Well, if they were humans, the Pope ruled, uh, they had certain rights. And so that when a country arrived at, this was the international law, when the country a, 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 a discoverer arrived at some country, they had three ways to obtain title to the land. And this was vitally important to them because if Portugal arrives and takes over a lot of land but doesn't have title, and then along comes Spain, you wanted to establish who had title. And the convocation ruled there were three ways to get title to Aboriginal lands. One, you could kill them. Aboriginals, but you could kill them. Uh, the second way is you could convert them. And the third way was to treat with them. In other words, sign treaties, which were legal documents and which uh, were upheld by various countries. It was found to be extremely expensive to try and kill everybody, although what the Spanish did about converting in South America, they would go to a village in the middle of the night, soldiers, and they would shout out in English, no, in Spanish, 
but not in a native language, they would shout out, receive the Lord, and if nobody moved, in, they would just kill them all in the village because they'd had the opportunity to become Christian. Uh, so we didn't do that. We didn't do that. We um, decided to enter into treaties because the United States, when it became the United States, was extremely poor, obviously, and it fought this you know, battle. There wasn't a whole lot of army. And so it was decided that it would be really a good idea to have treaties with Aboriginal peoples. And we had treaties all across the country. We had peace and friendship treaties. We had treaties of war in which we defeated certain tribes. And I say we, the United States. Um, now, when it came to the Pacific Northwest, the president said, please, treat with the tribes. We have, cannot afford a war. So you'll see continuously through the Pacific Northwest, 1850, 1855, uh, treaties made with tribes up and down uh, the, United, the uh, Pacific Northwest. They were exactly the same, really. They were just a boilerplate thing. They had basically the same issues in them. Uh, tribes would be asked to gather, and the leaders would they get them together. And mostly on the West Coast, uh, the former governor, uh, Governor Stevens, was asked to be the treaty maker. But he brought with him a man called General Sheridan. <laughs> For instance, when the Akamar Nation came together to sign a treaty, a number of the chiefs said no, they didn't want to sign that treaty. They'd heard that things didn't always go so smoothly for the natives. And Governor Stevens said to, Mr. to General Sheridan, uh, General, tell the, the leaders what will happen if they don't sign the treaty. And Sheridan said, well, what will happen is some non-Indians, some new people will get on your land and you'll kill them. And then the United States Army will come in, and we will kill you, and the rivers will run red with your, your blood. So it wasn't exactly like a sit down, have a nice friendly chat, and each agree to the contract. But the contracts were basically the same. The reason the United States wanted to sign the contract is because they wanted title to the land. Think about Astoria. You know, there was a big move to try and get England. What was that? Something blue. Oh, a rubber band. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm used as a politician to having things thrown at me, so I just want to <laughs> make sure. So that was the United States goal. It was to get title to the land so that the new immigrants could have a place to settle, to farm, and to be safe from the tribes. The issue for the tribes was. One, to reserve hunting and fishing rights and gathering of berries and, and uh, plants. That was one big thing, to reserve a way of life. Two, they got the United States in every treaty on the Northwest to say that they would protect the homeland from incursions of non-Indians. Because the tribes agreed in every one of these treaties that they would shrink back to a homeland. We call them reservations. And then the rest of the land, the vast amounts of that land that they controlled, would become the United States property. And um, so those were the things that they, particularly this will protect your land. That has long implications. It is now known as the trust doctrine. The United States has a trust responsibility to Native people. And I must tell you that it's going to be quite a hard to get all this in. This is an 11-week law school class. Most law schools now do, do teach federal Indian law. And it's a very complicated law, but I'm going to rush through it in 20 minutes. So the treaties are signed. The tribes agreed to shrink back to a reservation. But in many cases, particularly on the Columbia River and in 
in, uh, on, the, on the Puget Sound, they are asked to move further from the river, further from their lifestyle, which was fishing. And I'm going to talk particularly about the tribes of the Northwest, because that's those who, whom we most deal with. The United States really saw that it was important to deal with tribes because Article I of the United States Constitution, here they are designing the Constitution. Article I says, Congress shall have the power to treat with Indians. Well, they said trade, but it, it got expanded. It also says in the Constitution, a different article, it says states may not sign treaties. States are less sovereign than the United States and a tribe, because a treaty is a contract between two sovereigns. Tribal people in the United States are not dealt with by the United States as a minority. They are dealt with as citizens of another country, because that country is sovereign to a degree, not entirely. The treaty, the sovereignty can be lessened by um, giving up some sovereignty. For instance, the tribes gave up the right to make war. That's a very sovereign power. They gave that up. The United States said, we'll do it for you. We'll take care of keeping your enemies off your land. It didn't work very well, but because the General Allotment Act was passed in 1830, well, and what that said was the United States could parcel off land within the reservation. It's a very, very bad law, but there were others for the Congress. So tribes can give up some sovereignty. And it, they can, under the court's ruling, I, when I say court, it's always the Supreme Court. Under the court's ruling, there are other ways they can lose parts of their sovereignty. And I want you to think of a bundle of sticks. You can take war, that's one bundle. It can be changed, says the Supreme Court, by Congress. But there's a restriction on that. In other words, Congress can't just break a treaty because it would have to, under the Fifth Amendment, pay compensation. So the United States is bound by those things. The other thing that can happen to sovereignty of a tribe is the United States Supreme Court can rule in a way that diminishes some of that sovereignty. But the court has ruled the tribes are semi-dependent sovereign nations. Semi-dependent because they agreed to allow, in their treaties, to allow the United States to have power, plenary power, and it's through the Congress, not through the, the executive branch. Yes, and the court has ruled consistently, and the Congress has made laws consistently from the treaty times to now, but something happened in 1970. Prior to that, almost all the Supreme Court, or the cases that went to the Supreme Court, uh, were the tribes lost. We said they lost more cases than convicted felons. But in the 70s, tribes began across the nation to send their members to law school. And as John Echo Hawk, a Pawnee Indian who uh, runs the Native American Rights Fund, as he says, you can have all the rights in the world, but if you can't adjudicate them, they are not of use to you. Well, the tribes were continuously trying to adjudicate rights. But if you look at the United States Supreme Court Plaintiffs, it's almost always the United States versus Oregon, the United States versus Washington. Why the United States? They were representing the tribal right, but the, what, the reason the United States is there doing that is because they sued the state for violating the United States Constitution. 
Article 6 says, treaties, now this is Article 6, it's not some amendment like say, well, I don't like this amendment, but anyway, it's not an amendment. This is one of the six articles of the original Constitution. It says, treaties, and I have it here in case you want to see it, are the supreme law of the land and all judges are to be bound by them, state law notwithstanding. And what that means is a state cannot make a law that violates a treaty. Now, these treaties that Article 6 speaks of are not just Indian treaties. They're treaties with England or France or Germany. They're treaties. They have the same standing as, as those treaties. So what happened in the state of Washington? Well, the state passed a law that said, I mean, it sounds kind of trivial, but anyway, the state passes this law that says, you cannot take a steelhead uh, steel salmon by anything but hook and line. Does that matter to anybody? Well, yes, because they run at the same time as the salmon do. And because the tribes, fishing under treaty, take their fish in nets. It's the most efficient way to fish, and it's the only way you know whether, people, whether there's going to be some spawning left. It was a good way to fish. You string the net across the river, and you get so many fish, and then you lift the nets up, and those fish go up to spawn. But the steelhead ran at the same time. And so in the state of Washington, tribal fishers were being arrested over and over again by having a steelhead in their net. And they, they could not, I mean, it was just ridiculous to them. There were salmon, there were fish that they reserved the right to hunt and fish, and yet they were being arrested. Billy Frank, who's uh, an amazing man, he just died last year, a wonderful, wonderful man. He just got the uh, Presidential Medal of Honor. Billy was arrested 41 times, and I looked at his resume once, and I said, Billy, what about this four years? You didn't get arrested in those four years. He said, oh, no, I was in the Marines. <laughs> well, what happened was the state of Oregon kept allowing their judges to arrest and, well, their police to arrest, and their judges to to give sentences to these tribal fishers. And the United States said, no, 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 you can't do that. Went to the Supreme Court and said, you're violating Article 6 of the United States Constitution, which says treaties of the Supreme Law of the land, and no state may make a law that interferes with the treaty, and all judges will be bound by it. This is present day law. Oregon, same case. U.S. v. Oregon, they were being, tribal people were being arrested on the Columbia River under treaty. They fish under treaty, they get arrested because some steelhead is running in the same river. There was a very interesting case in 1819, sorry, 08, called U.S. v. Winans. Again, United States, plaintiff. And Mr. Winans was a man who owned a big piece of land on the Columbia River on the Washington side. Large piece of land. Perfectly legal. He got it from the state. He bought it from the state of Washington, who got it from the United States, who got it through a treaty. So in the treaties of uh, the Pacific Northwest, you can't interfere with a treaty right. And if the treaty says the right to hunt and fish at usual and accustomed grounds, that means where they always fished. So Mr. Winans got really upset because every spring, or I can't remember whether spring or fall, the fish started to run. And the Yakima tribal members came down from Yakima, crossed his land, went to the river. His land was on the continent, went to the river. They didn't stay there except to fish. Well, he said, that's terrible. That's private property. You cannot cross my land. He built a fence all around this huge piece of property. The United States sues him, U.S. v. Winans, and said, you can't interfere 
with a treaty, an, an exercise of treaty. These Yakimas signed a treaty. We got the land that we wanted. That was their part. Our part, we would protect these treaties. And this court ruled, the United States Supreme Court ruled, something very interesting, I think, in that uh, case. It said, treaties are not a grant of right to the Indians, but a grant of right from them. They owned everything. They had all the rights. They gave us some of the stuff, which we wanted, title to the land. And so Mr. Williams had to take his fence down. It, it, uh, it, it is very good for jurisdictions to know about treaty rights. Because if you cross that line, you run smack into the United States. It's not going to be you versus this pesky group of people crossing your land. It's going to be the United States because of its trust responsibility, which comes through its agreement in treaties that it would protect the rights of tribes. Now, I said that tribes are getting better at going to court, and it's true in many cases. Of course, they co plaintiff with the United States. But they're also doing some stuff in the Congress. There's a, uh, there was a, an act of, in the Congress called the Indian Child Welfare Act. I don't know if any, any of you have heard of that. Very controversial. People got very upset about it. Well, Basically, this act was pushed by uh, four ladies, one from uh, Yakima, one from Puyallup, one from uh, Nez Perce, and one from Macaw. They found that their children were being taken to foster care. The state sort of ruled that oh, well, it would have been much better for a child being in a white home than in an Indian home. And they were losing large numbers of their children. And then, so the Congress passed this act. Yes, you can adopt an Indian child, but you have to, the tribe that child comes from has to be made aware, and they have to continue to have a jurisdictional role. Why, you think? Because 15, 16-year-old Indian kids were turning up at the nearest reservation saying, we don't know who we are. And that's understandable. They were in homes that were totally different from them. And the, these tribal people said, what we need is for our courts to at least know where these children are, to have a jurisdictional role. And that uh, case, that uh, uh, law is in, in place today. Uh, the, there's a, a United States ca uh, congressional case, a congressional act, which protects religious sites. People have for years been digging up what looks just like archaeological sites, but in fact are sacred sites, all may have bodies of, of tribal members. And I remember once when a woman called Ramona Bennett, who was chairwoman of the Puyallup tribe, uh, she got so tired of people digging up things that she wrote a grant for a group of students. And the grant was to dig up and do an archaeological look at the White Cemetery in Seattle. And she said, well, they've been digging us up for ages. <laughs> we thought this might be education. Of course, she didn't mean that they would actually do it. But it brought to highlight what these losses have been for tribal people. But I'm saying it this all as if we're only thinking about treaties in terms of tribal rights. We, I have a house in Helvetia. I only legally have it because of a treaty which the Falafeli Tualatis signed a treaty, gave up land, shrunk back, in fact were moved to Grand Ronde. And we're very lucky because we have in, Hel almost into Helvetia, a place called the Five Oaks Treaty Site. Now there are only two oaks left, I'm afraid, uh, because it's now become a, a um, there's lots of buildings around them and these trees aren't doing very well. But they are, that is the place where the Tualities and the Falafis came together to sign the treaties 
And so um, we hear, and this, there are lots of burial sites in Helvetia, in Hillsborough. There are farmers who have known about these sites and who have protected those areas and have refused to allow people on them. And they are now those farmers reaching out to the Grand Ronde tribe to bring their cultural people in to say, well, what are these wonderful things that are there, which these farmers, bless their hearts, have been protecting since they, they, they and their family have been there. I imagine you'd like to know a little bit about gaming. <laughs> gaming is a very interesting issue here. Well, in Washington, uh, in um, California, a little rancheria tiny little tribe, decided that they looked at the Catholic Church and they said, well, they do high stakes bingo. We're going to do it on our land. We're going to, I think it was $500 was the highest, whatever. And they, they had a little high stakes bingo game going on their land. California raided that property, went on the reservation, closed the, the bingo hall down, said, we don't allow gaming in California, so you can't do it. When, Hmm? Go to yes, go to Nevada. So that went all the way up to the Supreme Court. That tribe took the case to the Supreme Court. And the um, court ruled that a state has no jurisdiction over an economic enterprise on tribal trust land, land that is in trust for the tribe. The Congress was very upset by that ruling because it thought, oh my goodness, you know, all these people are going, oh my goodness, we have to have the state have jurisdiction. And so although I hear all the time about, oh, Congress gave these tribes this right to game, what in fact Congress did, passed a, a, a bill called the National Indian Gaming Act, it is a, a restriction of what the Supreme Court said. The Supreme Court said state has no jurisdiction. The National Indian Gaming Act says you have to have a compact with the state, uh, which all the tribes who have gaming, they get enter into a compact with the state. The only state that has no gaming is Utah because it doesn't allow any kind of gaming. And the act said if there's gaming in the state, uh, the tribe must enter into a compact with the, with the state. And it's, it's been very successful for tribes. It's been very successful for states. Six percent of the income from the Grand Ronde Reservation goes to the state of Oregon. And that's quite a chunk of change. So instead of looking at it as many people do is, oh, it's not fair. Why can they game and we can't? Well, it's because they are sovereigns. They have treaties. They have semi-dependent sovereigns. They have treaties. For instance, if you do any of you go to Bend, yes, you drive across the Warm Springs Indian Reservation. What you're actually doing is entering another country. Now, the, what the Warm Springs tribe has done, and what many tribes do, is they've entered into a compact with the state. So if a tribal police pull you over, and you're not a tribal member, the tribal police can only uh, have jur jurisdiction over tribal members. If they pull you over, they're cross-deputized with the state. So it's as if a state officer pulled you over for traffic violations. But it, the tribe has not given up its sovereignty. It has just shared it. And um, it works pretty well. They get on. Worse is when it's a very distant reservation. The state doesn't want to come onto a you know, reservation that's hundreds of miles away. So it's very hard for, that was a case called the Suquamish, a man called Oliphant, who lived on, and white, lived on the Suquamish reservation. And uh, he got very drunk one day. And they have a thing called the Suquamish days where they all get together. And, and this guy, Mr. Oliphant, uh, took his car and drove it into a police car, a, 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 a Suquamish police car was arrested, and the court ruled that the, the tribe did not have jurisdiction over this man because he was not a tribal member. And that has made a lot of trouble over time. I mean, just think if the police in Portland couldn't arrest somebody who's from Nevada 
or Canada. You do. You do. You, you violated the law. The law has, not so on an Indian reservation. If you're not a, a tribal member or a resident tribal member, uh, the, the, the tribe has no jurisdiction over you. And uh, that's an increasing problem. So what else did I want to tell you? See, we're down through about nine weeks now. <laughs> I just want to see if there's anything. So I guess my point is, and I'd love to answer questions, I guess my point is, don't assume that it's the same as somewhere else. Like, yes, they're, the tribal people are the only dual citizens in this country. They are, they are looked on first as, you, they were given citizenship, I thought it was so generous of the Congress, in 1924, uh, because of their tremendous um, the volunteerism in the in the war, they they are not bound to go to war because they've given up the right to go to war, but they do volunteer at very high rate. Um, so the the issue is be careful and look through the law because many jurisdictions have found themselves in great trouble by just thinking, well, we're all Oregonians. And they, tribal people may be Oregonians, but they may be also citizens of Warm Springs, Umatilla, Klamath. I don't know if we have time to get into the whole issue of termination, but if anybody know, has heard about that, I'd be happy to explain. That that was a 1950 uh, United States uh, Act, which uh, selected certain tribes and terminated their relationship to the federal government. Oregon was the hardest hit. 61 tribes and bands were terminated in Oregon. What it meant was the federal government could just take the land and sell it. It was a disaster. Uh, in the 1980s, there has been a, a there were six restoration acts which restored that federal status. Didn't give them back the land, didn't give them any money, but it restored that federal relationship, that government to government. And that is happening still uh, in the United States. Yes. Oh, thank you. Yes, I got a trip over in Now, I've never called you on the carpet before. Oh, that's terrible. That was awful. Okay, as folks are lining up for questions, if they had a reminder, of course, you need to be a paid up member of the forum. And if you're not paid up, somebody around here who may be to my right and over there will be happy to take your money and even, you know, double or nothing. Anyway, excuse me. Ladies and gentlemen, questions? Hi, Spencer Ehrman, forum member. Um, it feels a bit arbitrary, um, as though the various governments, state or federal, can kind of pick and choose which, what, what they'd like to do. When it comes to fisheries, as you explained, uh, the, federal gov the, the, the federal treaties will prevail, mm -hmm. and uh, Native Americans are allowed to uh, take fish as they, as they always have. When it comes to gaming, um, suddenly the states get to um, in, in, in force a law. How is that, the, 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 the tribes don't have, rel, uh, don't have relationships with the states. Their relationship is with the federal government. That's right. So how does the state get to um, uh, uh, get involved in, in gaming, I guess is the question. Well, it's a terrific question because if you think of the rivers, they are, by, they are there's federal, state, maybe a number of states, jurisdictional, and then there are the tribes have a jurisdiction over, say, the Columbia River. It's divided. Um, and so that's worked out through a treaty um, negotiation. You have to have the right to hunt and fish in usual and accustomed grounds. Does that mean they can fish all day long, all night? No. Tribes, under the Supreme Court, has ruled that you. Tribes cannot be restricted, treaty tribes, those who sign these treaties, 
cannot be restricted unless all other fisheries have been restricted. So the ocean fishery, then you go to the sports fishery, or the commercial fishery, then the sports fishery. Those can, uh, for conservation reasons, you know how many fish are coming, you know how you, those can be restricted, and only then can tribal fishery be restricted. Is it arbitrary? Oh yes. The state of Oregon wanted to have a hand in gaming. They don't want everybody, tribes having thing young. They wanted to have a hand in organizing. So they went to their congressional folks. And the Congress said, in this circumstance, and Congress has plenary power because of the Article I of the Constitution, they said, <clears throat> these tribes must negotiate with the state. And it's true, it's a very different situation from usually. Usually they don't. They have good relations with the state, but their relationship is federal to federal, government to government. But if, a con if Congress passes an act that gives a certain power to a state, and it's not a violation of the United States Constitution, Congress can do that. A quick follow-up. Um, so rivers like the Deschutes and the Willamette are entirely within the state of Oregon, right. as opposed to the Columbia, which starts in, in Canada and then winds sure. line, line, line sure. up crossing three states. Um, are those rivers treated differently than the Columbia? No. Okay. If there's a treaty, it's for where, where did those folks fish? So the Yakimas used to live right on the Columbia. Or, or the, the Falafeli, maybe that was their major fishery, was on the Willamette. So it's a, it's a the right to take fish at usual and accustomed grounds. That's the way it's written. So that's how the, the federal government looks at it and, and decides, or helps decide. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming. Emily Neff, for a member, lawyer, ECWA. Are you ready? Uh, one of the things I've noticed is Canadian, uh, Native Americans are not treated the same under ICWA, the adoption rights for tribal consent, and I found that fascinating. And also, could you talk a little bit about the Alaska Native Americans mm -hmm. that are not technically, we had a gal in law school with us that was a Tlingit, mm -hmm. and we heard all about Tlingit tribes, and they're even independent inheritance laws that they're able to preserve. Yes, yes. First of all, the Canadian tribes, there are only about two treaties. Uh, Canada did not enter into treaties. Um, so they have uh, dealt with First Nations in Canada, dealt with differently. Uh, ICWA only has control over U.S. citizens, uh, as you know. Um, Alaska, very different, very different. Alaska, Congress, there were very few treaties. Metacatla was the only treaty I know of, uh, Alaska treaty. Congress looked at what's going to happen when the pipeline goes through. It all, it all hinged on that. And the tribe said, gee, we're going to let them put this pipeline through our land. We are going to have some power. So they went to the Congress, and they went to their own government, and they said, um, to the Congress, we want a we want a law that that uh, defines our status as Alaska natives. What is the status? Because they're on treaties. Well, there was a great deal of um, work done on that piece of legislation, and I don't want to sound suspicious of the Congress, but um, that bill went from the negotiating to the Senate and changed. Now, in Alaska, Alaska tribes have very complicated land ownership. And that legislation set up corporations, native corporations, not tribes, corporations. So they're governed by corporate law, not there are very few treaties. 
And so the Alaska natives have a very, very difficult time of uh, holding onto their, their uh, property, onto their burial sites, because they are ill-defined in this bill, which really set out to make sure the pipeline uh, was not st stopped at any point because it became so important. Uh, will the Alaska Natives uh, be able to change that? It's difficult when you look at the Alaska delegation. To, now, Alaska Natives do get the law, the uh, oil revenues that other Alaskans get. They, so they do get that uh, money for, from the oil reserves. But uh, Alaska Natives are not in a very good position because they don't have treaties that you, you know, if it's not written down, we whites don't think it's real. You know, you can't go and, well, I'll tell you about a case where it went beyond that. U.S. v. Washington, very, very conservative judge, Judge Bolt, I'll, I'll, sorry, I'll get right to it. This was the big fishing rights. So Judge Bolt, I must admit people were a bit worried about him, but, so he goes to stats, tells the court, and uh, Senator Gordon Smith, no, not Gordon Smith, sorry, I was not, I like Mr. Gordon Smith. Senator Slate Gordon of Washington was the Attorney General at the time. So there's an old man in the back, Billy Frank's father, in the back of the courtroom, and an, a lady, a, 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 a tribal member, says to the judge, I don't know what he's to the law, about what the lawyer is investigating, you know, what Slate Gordon is saying. He, she said, Judge, I don't know what he's talking about. And at that moment, old Billy Smith, old um, Billy Frank, is in the back, of, and he said, Your Honor, I can talk to her. Oh, the Attorney General jumps up, oh, you can't do that, you can't do that. Judge Paul said, yeah, I think you can. So they had a conversation, and then that <coughs> witness was able to say, oh, I understand now, this is what it is. There came a point in that trial which was very, very long, very long, and Billy Frank and his father had to come in from Olympia to that courtroom, and uh, one day Billy Frank said to Judge Bolt, Judge, I can't bring Grandpa any longer. It's too far for him to come, so he's going to have to stay home. And the judge calls the attorneys up and said, uh, Tomorrow we will have court in Grandpa's house. That shook Slate Gordon up a bit, I imagine. And that was his respect for these. It was hearsay. They could talk about what their great-great-grandfather had told them, but they couldn't show it on a map. And Judge Bolt really uh, accommodated that. But it was, of course, his decision was also upheld by the Supreme Court. Sorry, yes. My name is Bill Kroger, I'm a foreign member. Thank you for coming in today. You're very knowledgeable. I appreciate your conversation. I wanted to add uh, something to we, that was asked earlier, and then I have a question after that. Um, in regard to the uh, governor's jurisdiction of gaming casinos and stuff, if it's, if it's my understanding that if there's an impasse, for example, if the governor just ideologically says no gaming in our state, that the Secretary of the Interior, I think, can override that. So it's not totally in the state's control to do something like that. It can go back to the feds, but I think it's a lengthy process. But it is actually in the national, it's called IGRA, the National Indian Gaming Act, right. that it is, the, it is the governor who must enter. It, it gave a huge amount of power to the state, but the, but the Congress thought, listen, that's, he's gonna, he or she is going to have to deal with gaming. So no, and to my knowledge, it remains with the governor. Oh. Except in Utah, where they don't have any gaming, so they, the governor says, I won't negotiate. Okay, well, I thought, I thought the Secretary of the Interior could override it. And usually that would be the case, except Congress put it specifically. Well, my question is, is that, and I've done some reading about Indians, and I know that you were corroborating what you said, that, that when, the, when the young Indians were taken off to white schools, and then especially when the Indians were selling off their tribal rights and their land and stuff, that, uh, that the, the, the welfare of the Indian population in this country really went downhill. And they realized after studies and analyzing it that the Indians need the tribes to function and to, to become whole and to feel good and everything. And, uh, and so consequently, I was just kind of wondering uh, if you get around with the Indians and stuff today, I was kind of wondering 
how, how life is on Indian reservations. You know, my image still is when I was a kid growing up, it was poor and yep. run down, broken fences, the whole thing like that. And uh, I know the gaming has helped a little bit, and alcoholism, alcoholism was pretty rampant, I think yes. it still is. But yes. I was just curious as to what is going on there today. Well, um, it depends, of course, on where you are, what reservation. If it's a reservation that has gaming that is a good location, uh, as people say in business, location, location, it may be doing very well. Grand Ron does very, very well, but it's on a very busy highway. Um, there is a big movement in this uh, in the United States of churches who are saying, wait a moment, those schools that, would, that they ran, government hired churches to run those schools, they are beginning to say, uh, those, th there's, there's trauma as a result of that. And in Canada, the same kind of schools, uh, two years ago the Canadian government uh, just awarded $2 billion in reparations and they just came out with a report which has really shaken up Canadian. Same thing happened here, and I think we're going to get much more um, uh, attention. Certainly the churches are beginning to say, we have a responsibility in this. Um, it's a sort of generational trauma. You know, the hair was cut off. I, I know a lady who, um, who went to a school. She was at a school up in uh, Yakima. And, um, she was a sort of feisty young woman. She was a feisty kid. She didn't want her hair cut off. She wanted to speak her language. And she was tied up every night and hosed with a hose in winter weather. That was trauma. That was, that happened. Not all the time, but that happened enough that people became very fearful of it. And uh, there's a book I'd love people to read. It's called um, uh, Broken Circle. And it's about the, the uh, Canadian experience. Chris Leslie, foreign member. Uh, great having you here, Elizabeth. The uh, idea that owning land was not a concept the Indians had. It was the wind on the land. True, true. And uh, for their spiritual power, it's not uh, a religion. And that's uh, one of the problems that we had with Greece going in and trying to convert them and then getting killed and, and the soldiers. Sure, sure, sure. The question is, now, who owns the mineral rights to a lot of these reservations? That's very important. I think they're going to find rare elements on a lot of these reservations since they're sort of stuck out in the woods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are the, the mineral rights under treaty? Well, if a treaty spoke of the mineral rights, um, and some did, and said that the tribes owned, remember they're giving up vast amounts of land. They're going to move off. Okay, so they're giving up all this stuff, and they're going to move off. Um, in, in Alaska, they don't own the mineral rights. That's under a, a U.S. Uh, con um, uh, congressional act. In North Dakota, unfortunately, there is a tribe who are fracking their land for oil. That destroys the land, but they own the resource. So people make bad decisions, whether it's in Alberta or... So it would depend tribe by tribe what the treaty actually said. They're not all exactly the same. That's a problem. Yes, it is a problem. Yeah, and then it has to be interpreted, of course, by our courts. And the Supreme Court has been pretty good on Indian issues. Uh, I mean, pretty uh, understanding. But these are this is a different situation from a, any other plaintiff. I wonder if many people know you're the first African-born person to serve in Congress. I don't think so. <laughs> I was on a plane going to uh, Mandela's uh, inauguration. I was so lucky that Mr. Clinton put me on the delegation. And we're sitting around, it's, it, this plane it takes forever to get to South Africa. And we're all sitting around, and Jesse Jackson was on the plane, and Maya Angelou, and, and many, many African Americans. And we, we had quite a bit to drink. It was a long way to go. <laughs> and at some point, I said, well, you know, I'm an African American. Jesse Jackson looked at me and said, yes, you are. <laughs> so from then on, I was called an African American, and I am. I was born in Kenya, East Africa, and the only African born to be. 
What were you drinking? <laughs> oh gosh, who knows? Who knows that that were you drinking? A lot. Too much. <laughs> um, Jim King, former member, two issues. Yes. Um, weren't the Native Americans not the original settlers of North America and merely the most recent? Because previous waves of settlers were pushed out and conquered by the Native Americans like a thousand years ago. And since all continents have a terrible history of dealing with Aboriginal species, South America, Europe, Asia, Africa, and Australia, isn't North America the least worst continent in dealing with Aboriginal species? Thank you. Well, I think you're, the idea of Aboriginal, that may well have been Aboriginals before, but it's the, it was who was there who was possessing, well, using the land, became the entity that the United States once wanted to deal with. Because they didn't want the next wave of immigrants to say, oh, wait a minute, we'll take over this land. So. Um, I don't know for sure whether whether there were large populations prior. Uh, there's anthropological information of 15,000 years of these you know people who are here today. Uh, but the United States wasn't very interested in that. They were interested in who do we have to get title from and who can we remove. Hi, Phil Nelson Forbes. Appreciate your talk today, and it was interesting in today's Oregonian. Perhaps you saw it. Yeah. There's a story regarding an expurgation of a conviction uh, many, many years ago of a tribal leader for fishing law violation. Oh, so you might look at the I Oregonian today if you haven't seen it. Yeah. And that was pretty apt. But my concern a little bit here is in regard to the prevalence of tribes in, let's say, the western United States. And I've seen maps of, of California, for instance, that show that there were tribes everywhere, literally covering all of the state. And yes. I imagine that probably was the case here. Uh, and I was wondering if you could speak to that history and a little bit about tribal recognition. There's been quite a bit of tribal recognition, right. I gather, in, uh, in recent years. Yes, Thank in the state of Oregon in particular. In California, uh, to my knowledge, most of the tribes are very small. They're called rancherias. Uh, now, there are some big tribes. And uh, they ha did have treaties in California because Governor Stevens kept working his way down. He, he was just making treaties all the way down. Um, now my brain went blank. The second part of your question. Recognition. Oh, yes, recognition. You can, a tribe can lose recognition in two ways. Every year, the Department of Interior presents to the president a list of federally recognized tribes. Those are tribes who the Department of Interior, Bureau of Indian Affairs, recognizes, and they can slip off the list. Literally, there have been tribes where they, the, their name wasn't put on the list, and suddenly it's, oh, we're not recognized. Then they have to go through a program called the Federal Acknowledgement Program. The only way is through termination. Termination ends the federal relationship. And those tribes who are terminated are no longer federally recognized tribes. So the federal acknowledgment is there. However, Article 13 of the Federal Acknowledgment Program says there is a bar to the Federal Acknowledgment Program if you have been named in a termination act. For a long time, people thought there was then no way around it. What could they do? Well, a professor in Oregon, Charles Wilkinson, a law professor down at the University of Oregon, devised a theory, an old law theory. He said, well, if you can be terminated by an act of Congress, you can be restored by an act of Congress. And he went and worked with the Menominee tribe who were terminated, worked with Celeste's tribe, in Oregon, and in 1979, they were the first restored tribe in Oregon. And that's what you have to do. You have to make a law, you make a petition, go to your member of Congress, and you have to prove certain points, eight points that you do, that you've had meetings, that you've had elections. It's a very onerous business. 
All the tribes in Oregon have been restored by acts of Congress, except the Clatsop-Nehalem tribes on the coast. And they have just had a bill introduced by Congresswoman Bonamici, and uh, they could be restored by that bill. Uh, so we now have 10 federally recognized tribes in Oregon, and uh, seven of six of those are restored tribes. And they have the full faith. Now their treaties, unfortunately on the east, on the west coast, the little tribes, Clats of Nehalem, Cow Creeks, Coos, Loamco, those tribes who are now restored, had treaties. But oops, it never got to the Senate. They were not ratified by the Senate. And in 1871, the Senate said, we're not ratifying any more treaties. Now, in the meantime, the tribes had moved off that land, done what they had, they thought the treaty was in place. But they are, uh, they, without a federally ratified treaty, um, they're kind of, they're kind of lost. They don't have those treaty rights that they can adjudicate. And it wasn't their fault that they were not ratified. They just didn't get to the Senate. Phil. Real fast. I was glad to hear you mention Native American Rights Fund. Yes. And I believe in the American Indian Educational Foundation. Both uh, are great organizations. Would you comment on either one? And the Native American Rights Fund was founded by um, John Echo Hawk, who's a Pawnee lawyer. Uh, most of his family are, are lawyers, and then his uh, nephew became Secretary of Interior, Larry Echo Hawk. And they handled cases for tribes. They were the first law firm for tribes, so that a tribe could come to NARF, Native American Rights Fund, and bring their case. Now, many tribes have their own attorneys. However, the Native American Rights Fund handles the big, big cases, like the uh, Cobell settlement where the Department of Interior had stolen, I think it's $6 billion, but that's been, uh, yeah, that's, that's been, um, they lost the paperwork. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> anyway, it's been in, in uh, court for many years, and now it has been settled that, they, that the Department of Interior did. So yes, I, I don't know the other organization as well, but I think Native American Rights Fund is a very, very well-run, very, very uh, noble place. They've had about uh, 10 cases in the last year, and they've done well. Yes, they have. And uh, John Echo Hawk, as I say, was, he was the first law, Indian law student. And then he became a lawyer, and then he became head of NARF. Yes, a great guy. Well, thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. It was very informative. Next week, we have, we don't have a Democrat. We don't have a Republican. Next week, we have Mr. Sal Parada. I hope I'm pronouncing his last name correctly, from the Independent Party, the newest party in Oregon. We'll see you at noon next week, same time, same station. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rob.